Help Midvision keep bringing you material by becoming a Patreon member, as well as PayPal. Like, share, subscribe, and comment. Jason, folks, Dragons and Genesis question here about Enoch. Enoch seems to be a mysterious player. He comes and goes. He just, I mean, he plays such a funny, weird 365-year life here in the mm. genealogy in Genesis, and then, boom, he walked with God and was not no more, something like this. Um, can we really understand this guy, and what's the significance of this player called Enoch? It seems... It seems that uh, Christians don't really know much about him. They All they know is this little, like, if there were a million hairs on your head, they know two two hairs. And and he he pretty much was walking upright, perfect with God, and was no more. They don't really look at the Book of Enoch, usually. They don't really look at Second Temple literature. They don't really know any type of other story about this guy. So you seem to be fascinated with him. So what is Enoch? Who is he? What's he about? What the heck is going on? So, early in Genesis, um, after the Garden of Eden, Cain and Abel, all that, you have these two different little genealogies, one for Seth, one for Cain, and you have an ancestor for Noah, and his name is Enoch. He lived 365 years, and then he walked with God. Now, everyone else in that little passage, they live a certain amount of years, and then they die. <clears throat> Enoch got, it says Enoch walks with God. Right. And then it just kind of moves on, and it's like, wait, hang on. Back the train up. Because I think you just said that this man just ascended bodily into heaven instead of dying. What's up with that? But it doesn't tell you anything. It like Enoch is just gone from the narrative forever. Now, we have these weird little issues when studying the New Testament. And this has been a problem literally since the beginning. Uh, all the way back to the earliest days of Christianity, people have had difficulty reconciling Christianity with Old Testament Judaism. I mean, that's like half of what Paul writes about. So our oldest surviving uh, literature from Christianity is tackling this exact topic. How do we reconcile Christianity with Second Temple, Old Testament, Judaism? And if you try, you end up with like 30,000 different Christian denominations and no one can agree on anything. That's a good point. Right. I mean, that's a back... You're talking about looking at the anatomy of a human body and not, not looking at the bone structure. I mean, it's like... Right. If you don't see... Their second temple foundation, if you will, to some of this New Testament stuff. You're going to yeah. miss out. You're going to easily right. run off into some... And it's gotten so bad that there are many Christians now whose Bible doesn't even contain an Old Testament. And I, like, I've, I was like, what? I've seen this. Like, they're out there. It's very popular now. Christian Bibles, and it's just the New Testament. It starts with Matthew, it goes to Revelation, and that's it. Because Christianity almost doesn't need the Tanakh. It, it doesn't need any of these books. It stands alone. But if you read it on its own, or even if you read it with the Old Testament, you still have some problems. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament is not apocalyptic. You know, you... You do the right thing, and you are granted a nation, and all is right with the world. You maintain this law code, and all is right with the world. In the New Testament, if you do this good stuff, you go to heaven. The law doesn't matter. Or in some places. It's faith. Right. It's this personal relationship. It's this communion with the Lord. That matters. And then you have other places where they're trying to Judaize it. Yes, that's they're like, I mean. well, you need the law. You workers mean, of lawlessness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, what? Confusing. 
Yeah, confusing. They're, they're, but even then, they're trying to reconcile things. They're trying to bridge this gap. You know, how do we get the Old Testament and the New Testament to shake hands? And people don't know how. And if you read the New Testament in the context of the Old Testament, you still have a problem. Yeah, you know, I mean, you got a problem with Jesus. You, you basically have a demigod walking around Earth who is the son of the Most High. That's polytheism. That's a problem, and that doesn't mesh with Mosaic theology. You know, um, the origin of evil is another big one. In the Old Testament, evil comes from disobedience. It comes from doing the wrong thing. You didn't make this proper sacrifice, or you hung on to some loot that you got after a battle, or you didn't obey these little rules, you know, that were connected with this land deal. Or you worshipped God in the wrong way. You set up a little visual representation instead of just imagining him. You know, you're doing it wrong. Or maybe you worship the wrong gods or an older version or something. But in the New Testament, there are these things called demons that are kind of behind everything. And they can get inside of people and they can corrupt people. They can make you do all kind of crazy stuff. And the world has to be purified through fire. That's weird. That doesn't match up with what we've been reading in like the 30-some-odd books of the Old Testament. There's a problem. There's something missing. But we're not missing it. In like the 1540s, a Scottish explorer who was trying to find the headwaters of the Nile went into Ethiopia and he found it. It was this whole section of books that we didn't have. And this was a material that seemed like it belonged in the Old Testament. It was in their Old Testament, the, the Ethiopian Christians. He didn't even, hell, to this day, we don't even know how they got there. We have no record of any group of Christians going to Ethiopia in like the 3rd or 4th century AD. But somebody did, and they started a church that has lasted to this day. And in their Old Testament, there's this thing called One Enoch. Well, we call it one Enoch. They just call it Enoch. And it's made up of five sections. And when you start reading it, all of a sudden you start seeing things that are familiar to you. You see the Son of Man. You see the idea that evil comes from demons. We see the story of the fallen angels. We see the corruption of nature. We see the promise of a future purification. We see the whole apocalyptic vision writ large across the entire book. We see references and uh, commonalities that simply don't exist with the Old Testament. This is a different form of Judaism that seems more in line with Christianity. And if you read 1 Enoch, and then you start reading the letters of Paul, a curious thing happens. You start to see that maybe Paul isn't this weird rebel who's taking Christianity and moving it in a different direction. Oh, he's he just wants to make it sort of pagan so he can sell it to the Gentiles. Enoch says to sell it to the Gentiles. Centuries before the author of Paul was ever born... We have a group of Jews saying that this ideology is for the whole universe and that Gentiles are a part of this. And that doesn't match with the Old Testament. And so when it comes to the book of Enoch, I think it may be a massive piece of the puzzle that we just didn't know what to do with because we thought we had the puzzle finished. And despite the fact that we have this gaping hole in the middle to try to reconcile Judaism and Christianity, we've taken this thing that sort of bridges that gap. And we just shoved it off the table and have just been ignoring it for literally 500 years. But people are now coming to the realization that this bizarre book and the bizarre thing it says may have some relevance to New Testament studies. Uh, this really began in earnest in the 1980s with uh, a brilliant woman named Margaret Barker, whose 
writing can be so intricate and dense that it can literally give me headaches. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, reading one of her books called The Older Testament, I went through like half a bottle of ibuprofen just from reading. And I was like, I'd have to read one paragraph three or four times just to understand. It's like, if you ever tried to read something while you were half asleep, oh, you yes. read it and then you realize you haven't picked up anything and you have to start the page over. Mm -hmm. That is what reading Margaret Barker can be like when you're fully caffeinated. It just, it's like, is, am I smart enough to be opening this book? <laughs> and at times, you don't think you are. Now, not all of her books are like that. Um, the, um, the Lost Prophet and Temple Theology. Highly recommended for anyone who thinks that there's something missing, you know, from this transition between Old Testament and New. Definitely check those books out. But we're just now starting to to take a fresh look at this book and think, okay, maybe it's not just this book about angel sex and giant vampires and all this other bizarre stuff. Because it has some very interesting things to tell us. Like the whole idea of purgatory, which popped up fairly early on in Christianity. But Protestants have rightly pointed out for centuries, this isn't biblical. Well, no, it's not in the Bible. It's an Enoch. You know, they thought, oh, well, you know, th this idea of, you know, God having a son on earth, that doesn't fit with the Old Testament. No, but it fits with Enoch. And over and over and over again, if there's something that you find in the New Testament and you have difficulty matching it up with the Old Testament, oh, I mean, Satan, the author of evil. That's not in the Old Testament. It's in Enoch. Over and over and over again, if there's something missing from the New Testament, or if there's something in the New Testament and you can't match it up, you can't reconcile it with the Old, there's probably one source for it, and that's Enoch. And Enoch, I don't think it's just important for us to read now. I think it was important to the early Christians. There's a, there's one version of Enoch. It has a yellow cover. I can't remember who wrote it or, or who, who compiled this, but it has a commentary. And the commentary is mostly just a person citing where it matches up with a scene in the Bible. Uh, so it's not really much of a real commentary. Just, oh, here's where the scene in Enoch matches up with something in the Old Testament or the New Testament or what have you. But that book is invaluable for seeing its impact on the New Testament because it's difficult to go through a single two-page spread without seeing at least one passage that is being paralleled somewhere in the New Testament. Yeah. You go through it and it's like, oh, there it is. There it is. Oh, we got three on a page. Over and over and over. One of the translators that I read, when I was reading a version translated, one of the translators was very faithful to Enoch, and he said that over 50 references, now check this out, in the New Testament of Enoch. So mm -hmm. it isn't like Enoch has parallels just to the New Testament or Old Testament, of course, Hebrew right. It's It's that you can see citations in the New, like not just Jude, obvious second peter obvious like so citations throughout the new yes. testament narrative quoting enoch and you have to go come on guys, yes why aren't you why is this not a book you use yes. if you're going to you want to know the contextual theological historical cultural milieu and understand the mindset behind the authors or at least what their sources were mm -hmm. you should look at enoch and consider how valuable was this to them if they're going to use it right and if you do that, if you look at all the times that New Testament authors are quoting anybody, and you, you chart it, how many times they quote Genesis, how many times they quote Leviticus, how many times are they quoting, um, I don't know, Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, do that for all of them. Enoch tops the list with like 57, I think, direct references to Enoch. I think, 
Isaiah comes in a distant second with like less than a dozen. I mean, it's like, it's, and the, the one in Isaiah, it's like the same quote over and over and over and over again. Uh, it, it gets quoted like four or five times, uh, you know. But yeah, it's Enoch is quoted not just more than any book in the Old Testament, but significantly more. I think you can actually take the five most quoted books of the Old Testament and they still don't match up with the number of times Enoch is quoted in the New Testament. I definitely want to check into that. It, yeah. It's insane. Interesting. And you you read Enoch, like, read the, read the Old Testament. Just you go shut off YouTube. Go, go read it real quick. Read the Old Testament real quick. Then read the book of Enoch. And then read just the writings of Paul. Seven letters, it's like 20,000 words. And f try to figure out which one he matches more closely with. The Old Testament or Enoch? It's not even a comparison. The number of parallels I've found between Pauline thinking, Pauline Christianity, and Enoch, it's sort of like matching up Homer with the Gospel of Mark. The, these parallels, they are numerous and they are significant. These are major parts of the theology. You know, it, it's not minor things. It's major stuff like spreading the word to Gentiles. Uh, well, like I said earlier, in early Christianity, we have this idea of purgatory, where, you know, you die, you don't necessarily go straight to heaven. You go into this dark holding cell for a while, and eventually you're redeemed, and you go to heaven. That's nowhere in the Old Testament. It's an Enoch. The idea that demons are responsible for corrupting nature. Enoch. The idea that the whole world will be purified in fire. Enoch. Jesus will come and purify the whole thing. Enoch, the son of man. Enoch. I mean, over and over and over. There's also the animal, um, not just the animal apocalypse, which is referenced in there as well, but I thought there was something interesting when I was starting to get into esoterics before I mm -hmm. deconstructed or deconverted, however you want to call it. And I, I thought it was interesting how Enoch would symbolize, he would take the law... Uh, the, the animals that were clean and unclean, and he would give an esoteric understanding and interpret mm -hmm. them and say, well, um, when it says do not eat the pig, what it means. And he, he literally gives you a commentary on what he, the Enochian writer, yeah. believes it means, and he says, do not eat the pig, or do not eat swine. The reason why is they're unclean and they eat their own, right? They eat yeah. anything, right? They're unclean. But he gives like an actual attribute to them, like he says the reason why you don't eat crows or a specific mm -hmm. type of bird. He goes, it's because they're thieves. Don't be like a thief, he says. That's why right. you don't eat them. And it's like, whoa, hold on. This At first, I thought it was just like, you know, you go back in the ancient Near East, you wanted to see why these Semitic people were separating yeah. themselves from their cultural neighbors who had pig bones that we could find archaeologically. Right, right. They separated themselves, making themselves different by not eating certain things and right. more, more sacred. And that did divide them from the nation groups around them. Right. Well, later on, when you get to Enoch, you find him say stuff like, um, it literally says something about not, don't eat the hyena. Now, I know that today we have a different science on this, but it's the idea of a hermaphrodite, like they're neither male nor female, they right, can't make right. their mind up. And this is in Enoch. And it's like, hold on, dude. Like, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's some hints in these things that nowhere in the Tanakh, nowhere in the law, like, it doesn't explicitly say any of this. Like, the reason why I tell you not to eat these yeah. things is because... And a lot of people go, well, the reason why is this health, health conditions. God doesn't want you to eat shrimp because he's afraid of salmonella or he's afraid of uh, yeah. hepatitis and, C. And that does not hold water because people throughout the ancient Near East were eating pork. The Israelites used to eat pork. We have pig bones at archaeological sites. Not up in the highlands because right. you're not going to raise pigs up in the rugged mountains, Okay. But in the lower areas, near rivers and the coastal regions, they were eating pork until sometime after the Babylonian exile, they just stop. Their religion suddenly shifted, and these animals that were easy to care for, they suddenly stopped. But they'd been eating those things for probably thousands of years. They knew how to cook pork. You throw it on the fire, when it's done, you eat it. You know, shellfish, those things are rejected. 
people have been eating shellfish forever. I mean, they, they, you know, they, I, they I know about the, the, <laughs> the, what is it? The Phoenicians. I mean, you've got yeah. all these ocean going people. I mean, they live on the Mediterranean. You're telling me that these people who hung out at the beach didn't know how to cook a shrimp. And it doesn't say don't eat the shrimp because you'll get sick. It says this is a corrupt animal. This animal is an abomination. Well, I don't know if this is a stretch, Jason, but I wanted to make the point, I guess, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, Paul? using a reference, he references in Old Testament, he says, as it is written, thou shalt not, you know, um, uh, what is it, uh, muzzle the oxen while it threshes, right? Mm -hmm. And he's using the Old Testament law code here. And then he literally gives you the commentary right after it because he's arguing with the Corinthians saying, you mean the 12 can get what they want, make money and all this and that, but me and Barnabas have to suffer? So he says, it is written. And he says, thou shalt not muzzle the oxen while it threshes. The idea that while an oxen works in the field, you need to feed it. You can't starve it while it's yeah. trying to help harvest and make your food and all that. And so um, he goes, does God care about animals? This is what Paul literally says. He says, yeah. No, he's talking about us. Mm -hmm. So he's so prophetic. He's got such a strange mm -hmm. supernatural complex in his worldview yeah. that he's like saying everything can kind of be reinterpreted. And it sounds like Enoch where he's like, yeah. well, did you think it meant just not to eat the pigs because of this? No, no, no. Don't eat pig because you don't want to be like this. And it's like a yeah, spiritualizing. Yeah. And we have this fascinating thing uh, that they – that you see in the animal apocalypse, which is in the fourth section of one Enoch, which they basically retell the entire history of the world, but all the people are recast as animals. Right. Okay. It's, it's fascinating and it has the coolest story title ever. <laughs> and so in the animal apocalypse, you get a sort of little veiled meaning as to why certain animals are corrupt, why certain animals are abominations. God made all these pure animals, things like cows and goats. And then these fallen angels, these evil entities, these, these sons of God who were evil, they came down to earth and they created corrupt creatures. And so huh. a pig, because like if, if you read the thing, like uh, was it Leviticus, it starts talking about, you know, the, these pigs and why they're corrupt and it doesn't say anything about getting sick. It says that, you know, a proper herd animal, it walks on four legs and it chews cud and it has cloven hooves. But if there's an animal that walks on four legs and has cloven hooves but does not chew cud, it's an abomination and you shall not eat it. If there's an animal that walks on four legs and chews cud and does not have cloven hooves, like a camel or a rabbit which rabbits don't actually chew cud. They just move their mouth a lot, and so they thought they were chewing cud. But if it, if it violates that category like that, it's an abomination. In the animal apocalypse, it tells us these were created between the union of demons and pure animals. And suddenly the whole thing makes sense. You don't eat pigs, not because of, you know, what, trichinosis, but because this is a corrupt creature. I mean, it tells you right there. It's an abomination because it was made by a demon. It was made by a fallen angel. The rabbits and the lobsters and the snakes and all these other things, they are incorrect creatures. They're abominations. They weren't made by God. They came from demons. You know, the same as the Nephilim, the, the the offspring of the sons of God and uh, human women, the, these giants who would run around eating people and stuff. And anyone who thinks that that may be part of like a bit of a stretch, just look at Zoroastrianism. A significant portion of the Jewish religion came from Persia. And this is another one of those traits. The whole idea of the these little kosher food laws based off of this crude taxonomy, that's Zoroastrian. That predates Second Temple Judaism by centuries. And they say the same thing. This, this evil 
entity, a Horoma, or not a Horomazda, a uh, Otterman, who became our Satan, basically wanted to corrupt creation and did so by creating a bunch of false animals like pigs and camels and shellfish and basically anything else that didn't neatly fit into their crude taxonomy. And so, yeah, it, it kind of tells us, again, in Enoch, why these animals are wrong, and that's because Satan created them. So Enoch is technically a great commentary if you're interested in trying to see how the framework of Second Temple Judaism looked at the Tanakh, really, yeah. how they viewed well, their story and their history. I've said this to other people, and I cannot stress it enough. If you want to understand early Christianity, I sincerely believe that Enoch is more important than the Old Testament. Interesting. I think you need to read Enoch and then read the New Testament. And you'll get a better understanding than if you read the Old Testament and then read the New. But I think without knowing the Old Testament, Enoch's going to sound like gibberish too. So it's right. important to know all of these things, right. but to see right. how they fit in your picture. Yeah. I mean, you need to understand Judaism, and that comes from the Old Testament. But for Christianity... But there's a, there's a, you're saying definitely, there's definitely a gap and there's a bridge required to really see. How. Yes. Okay. And Enoch, I think, is that bridge.